and welcome to this first look exploring session of Gizmond of Salern in love by the gentleman of the inner temple. Uh, as you may know, we have looked at variously uh, the printed play from 1591 of Tancred and Gizmunda. This is uh, our return to the thing we should have done first, which is the uh, original uh, manuscript. Uh, version of uh, the play as performed in uh, 1566 or 68 um, opinions vary performed before the Queen herself um, uh, so the the version we've done variously uh, was rewritten uh, slightly uh, how slightly we will discover as we go through this uh, this play now uh, by one of the authors uh, Robert Wilmot the play has five authors uh, who we will attempt to identify as we go along. Uh, so each act is uh, is by a different hand, and that may be more apparent this time around because it hasn't been reworked by a single author afterwards. Um, uh, to discover how Gizmond of Salern functions, uh, reading today, the argument, Claudia and Megara, is... Hi, I'm Craig. Um... Based on this chapter on Avon, I'm really looking forward to seeing what this is like from, in comparison to the original. Oh, sorry, not the original, the second version. <laughs> the other one. What would it be for? <laughs> so confused in our brains. Uh, reading Tancred and Gishard is... Muted. Liza Graham, I can talk like a real person. Uh, reading uh, one of the sonnets, uh, Gizmon and Gizmonda is... Rachel, actor on the East Coast. Uh, reading uh, another sonnet, uh, in theory sonnet, we call them sonnets, poem things, uh, as well as chorus in Act 2 and Lucrece is... Hi there, Angela, historian based in, uh, based in London and Warwick somehow at the same time. <laughs> Reading another sonnet as well as Cupid and Chorus in Act 1 and 3 is... Hi, I'm Eric. I have risen out of hell. As every as... morning. As we do. As we do. So, without further ado, let's uh, let's uh, have some sonnets of the Queen's maids. Uh, so, uh, we have uh, some poetry. Um, uh, and for the, the Queen's Maidens of Honour, uh, however that functions. So, uh, sonnet number one, Eric, take it away. They which too forethought that the heaven's throne is placed above the skies, and there do feign the goddess and all the heavenly powers to reign, they err, but and but deceive themselves alone. Heaven, unless you think more be than one, is here in earth. And by the pleasant side of famous Thames in Greenwich Court doth bide. And as for other heaven, there is none. There are the goddesses we honor so. Their palace sits, there shineth the Venus face. Bright beauty there possesseth all the place. Virtue and honor there do live and grow. There reigneth she that heaven doth deserve, whom worthy whom so fair goddesses should serve. And Angela takes to the, 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 the stage for another to the same people. Flowers of prime, peerless couched in gold, sun of our day, and gladdeneth the heart of them that shall your shining beams behold. Salve of each sore, recure of every smart, in whom virtue and beauty striveth so that neither yields. Lo here for you again, Gizman's unlucky love, her fault, her woe, and death at last, here fear and father slain through her mishap. And though ye could not see, yet read and rue their woeful destiny, so Jove as your high virtues don't deserve, give you such fears as may your virtues serve with like virtues, and blissful Venus send unto your happy love and happy end. And uh, sonnet three, or poem three, uh, Rachel. Gisman, that Willem lived her father's joy and died his death, 
now dead doth as she may by us pray you to pity her annoy and to reacquaint the same doth humbly pray love shield you virtuous loves from like decay the faithful earl beside the like request doth wish those wheelful wights whom ye embrace the constant truth that lived within his breast his hearty love not his unhappy case to fall to such as standeth in your grace the king prays pardon of his cruel best and for amends desireth it may suffice that we his blood he teacheth now the rest of fond fathers that they in kinder wise entreat the jewels where their comfort lies and we their messengers beseech ye all on their behalfs to pity all their smarts and on our own although the worth be small we pray ye to accept our simple hearts avowed to serve with prayer and with praise your honors as unable other ways and then we'll just pause for a second um similar but very minor tweaks uh between the printed version and the uh one we have here um so yeah very similar um it is functioning as a prologue um for all this sonnet of the queen uh, queen's maids uh, stuff but you know it is discussing the plot a bit um and uh, and laying that out so it's uh, it's doing the prologue thing reasonably well um i hadn't really included that when we did the second look as actually a practical prologue and now i'm sort of going back to that thought now thinking there's, there's not bad material in there any thoughts on that before we move forward uh rachel um i wonder that i don't think there's a way of you know maybe verifying this but perhaps for a future production that maybe these people uh who read off these sonnets uh being the maids f also form the chorus at some point hmm I say it's it, it's designed for presumably that original performance, uh, uh, and that that's that's who they're addressing to. But who the actual performers are isn't stated. Is it sonnets of the ladies, or t in the pre-printing it's uh, to the queen's maidens of honour, but here it's a sonnet of the queen's maids. So I'm just um, maybe there's an ambiguity there. Anyway, let's find out what the play's all about, because it's entirely possible that there was, uh, written down on a, a bit of paper, uh, the argument for the play that the audience could have read. Um, not necessarily performed, but uh, av potentially available. Uh, Greg, could you tell us the argument, please? <laughs> the argument. Tancred, King of Naples and Prince of Salern, gave his only daughter Gismund, whom he most dearly loved, in marriage to a foreign prince, after whose death she returned home to her father, which, having felt great grief of her absence while her husband lived, so immeasurably he did esteem her, determined never to suffer any second marriage to take her from him. She, on the other side, waxing weary of that her father's purpose, bent her mind to the secret love of the Count Pallerin, to whom, he being likewise inflamed with love of her, by a letter subtly enclosed in a cloven cane, she gave to understood a convenient way for their desired meeting, through an old forgotten vault, one mouth whereof opened directly under her chamber floor into this fault when she was one day descended for the conveyance of her lover her father <clears throat> in the mean season whose only joy was his daughter is came to her chamber not finding her there and supposing her to have walked sorry and supposing her to have been walked abroad for her disport he sat him down at her bed's fate and covered his head with a curtain minding to abide and rest there till her return she nothing knowing of her father's unseasonable coming brought her so brought up her lover out of the cave into her chamber there her father espying their secret love and he not espied of them was upon the sight stricken with marvellous grief but either for that the sudden despite had amassed him and taken him taken from him 
all use of speech or for that he reserved himself to more convenient revenge, he then spake nothing, but noted their return into the vault and secretly departed. After great bewailing his unhap and charging his daughter with all, he commanded the earl to be attached, imprisoned, strangled, deboweled, and his heart in a cup of gold to be presented to Gismund. She filled up the cup wherein the heart was brought, and with, and with her tears and with certain poisonous water by her distilled for that purpose, and drank out this deadly drink, which her father, hearing, came too late to comfort his dying daughter, who for her last request besought of him, her lover and herself within one tomb to be buried together for perpetual memory of their faithful love. Which request he granted, adding to the burial himself slain with his own hand to be reproach of his own and terror of others' cruelty. Again, minor tweaks uh, between this and what the, uh, when it's reprinted later. But uh, yes, broadly speaking, it's all there. It's all there. Nice, cheerful, happy story uh, of, um, yeah, uh, daddy, daddy dearest. Um, uh, any thoughts in the room before we get into the play itself and act one? Uh, Angela. I don't know about this just telling everybody what's going to happen. I mean, it does make you wonder, think, oh, well, all right, then we'll, all, we'll pop out to the bar then, you know. <laughs> Well, so, you know, it's it's like if you've bought the programme, you know, you could read the synopsis if you want to. You don't have to. It's not forced down anyone's throat, you know. And maybe you had to nip out for, for a, to, you know, for a drink or, you know, for a wee or something. And, you know, you want to make sure you know where you are. Uh, Liza. I do like that. I don't know whether the argument would have been read out or simply... I don't know, available to people on some kind of printed sheet or something, but I do like that it gives a sort of content warning about what happens to Guichard, even if it takes away the suspense somewhat. Yeah, well, yeah, poor chap. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, but in a sense, because you never see that happening, in a sense, by, uh, by telling, telling us all this detail, um, it's, um, you know, is, is, is it better or worse, or is it just just more words telling us bad things uh rachel no 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 yes no okay let's uh go into act one uh scene one and we have the appearance of cupid Hello, I that in shape seem unto your sight, a naked boy, not clothed but with wing, am that great god of love that with my might do rule the world and every living thing. This one hand bears hope, short joyful state, with fair semblance the lover to allure. This other holds repentance all too late, war, fire, blood, and pains without recure. On sweet ambrosia is not my food, nor nectar is not my drink as to the rest of all the gods. I drink the lover's blood and eat the living heart within his breast. Well hath my power in heaven and earth been tried. The deep avern my piercing force hath known. What secret hollow did the huge seas hide where blasting flame my axe hath not forth blown? To me, the mighty Jove himself hath healed, as witness can the Greekish maid, whom I made like a cow grow grazing in the field, lest jealous Juno the fault should espy. The doubled knight, the sons, restrained course, his secret stealth, the slander tissue in shape transformed me, list not to discourse. All that and more I forced him to do, the bloody Mars himself. Hath felt my mind. I feared not I his fury nor disdain. This can the gods record before whose sight he lay wrapped fast in Vulcan's subtle chain. In earth, who doth not know my mighty power, he may behold the fall and cruel spoil of Troy, town of Asia, the flower so foul defaced and evened with the soil. 
who forced Leander with his naked breast so many nights to cut the frothy waves, but heroes love that lay enclosed and set. The stoutest hearts to me do yield them slaves. Who could have matched the huge Elcides' strength? Great Macedon, what force might have subdued? Wise Scipio, who overcame at length? But I, that am with greater might endued, who could have won the famous golden fleece, but Jason aided with Medea's art? Who durst have stolen fair Helen out of Greece, but I, with love that bold in Paris' heart? What nature's bond or laws restraint avails against my power? I vouch to witness truth to Murtry that with shame fast tears bewails her father's love still weeping at Peruth. But... Now the world not seeing in these days such present proofs of mine almighty power disdains my name and seeketh sundry ways to conquer and deface me every hour. My name suppressed to raise again, therefore, and in this age mine honor and renown by mighty act intending to restore down to the earth in spite now am come. And in this place such wonders shall ye hear as ye that your stubborn rebelling hearts in piteous tears and humble yielding cheer shall soon be turned by sight of others' smarts. This royal palace will I enter in and there inflame the Fregmunda so in creeping through all her veins within that she thereby shall raise much ruth and woe. Oh, this before your eyes will I show that you shall justly say with one accord, we must relent and yield. For now we know love rules the world, love only is the Lord. And Cupid entereth into King Tancred's palace. Um, yeah, uh, I, I missed a stage direction. Cupid cometh down from heaven, which I'm not quite sure where it's supposed to be placed. Uh, it was placed mid-speech, uh, as I've got it here. But I wonder whether it's just an opening gambit, um, for, for, for which should actually exist at the top of the speech. Uh, thoughts on the room, Eric? How are you finding uh, Vampire Cupid? Um... Uh, I, I think there are a few differences which actually make it a lot clearer what, as to what you're reading. Like um, there were some parts. Uh, I think it was the bit about Juno and turning um, Io into a maid or something, into a cow or what, it, was it Io? I can't remember. I have lost track of mythology. Um, and uh, like that bit was a lot clearer in this version, but that might be because I read the other version <laughs> first. Um, and there are a few differences. Like at the beginning, he kind of goes, okay, park the chariot over there on that mountain and I shall descend here while you while you go do the parking um yeah <laughs> it, and there's no descent from heaven i think until um may, maybe they like pushed it forward or pushed it back but i'm not entirely sure yeah there's 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 a lot of tweaks there's a lot of my you know minor word changes all the way through it i mean it's almost it's not quite every single line but there's every other line i think in average um also, it's a lot more detailed later on about the, the sort of things that you're holding in your hands, which actually I think makes it more unclear rather than clearer. Um, so in the later one, you've got fair repentance, uh, resemblance and repentance is in your right hand and things like that. Um, and there's, there's about 10 additional lines as well. I think slightly longer in the, the later rewrite. Um, but you're yeah, right, I, I think this, has... is slightly, this is slightly clearer. Yeah. The rewrite also has the whole, um, oh, yes, repentance shall take my shaft, <laughs> and all that bit, which is a bit, um, yeah, it's kind of funny, but also not in, in the context. Um, yeah, this pale dead um, arrow or something, and then, uh, you know, you shall hold my shaft and so on and so forth, which is a bit sort of. Yeah, in, in, in the other, this. you've got a brat, a bastard, an idle boy, a rod, a staff, to whip, a whip to beat him out. Um, kind of dialogue that doesn't necessarily land so well today, um, or it does in a different way. Um, any other thoughts? It's still, still yeah, I'm done. I mean, we're not here necessarily to play favourites, by the way, uh, but this is alternative text that we could uh, play around with. Uh, we don't have to follow one text if we don't want to. Um, Rachel? No, I, I was just going to say, like, uh, to, to that point of the little changes, the 
because I have the I have the whatever from the other text here because I printed it out because I liked uh, the Cupid speech so much. But um, there's a lot more. There there's a maybe not as much here, but there's um, uh, in the other one that we read, there's like the a lot of repetition of sound, and I think there's a change uh, in terms of the sound for uh maybe a different set of actors to take it or something on the, there's something, I, I mean, it's more polished uh, later on, I think. Not not that the, that makes this bad, but I just mean like in the way that you you would take it, like the uh, part where he says conquered and defaced, it's scorn and scoff. You know, it's those sounds, j just the rep that repetition of sound that turns the ear a certain way. Okay, let's get into uh, the action because uh, we, having had Cupid entering into King Tancred's palace and presumably cluttering up the attic, uh, Act 1, Scene 2, Gizmonda cometh out of her chamber. O oh, vain, unsteadfast state of mortal things, who trusts the world doth lean to brittle stay. Such fickle fruit his flattering bloom forth brings. Ere it be ripe, it falleth to decay. The joy and bliss that late I did possess and wheel at will with one I loved best, tis turned now into so deep distress hath taught me plain to know our state's unrest. Sith neither wit, a princely force may serve against reckless death that slays without respect the worthy and the wretch. A doth reserve so much as one for worthiness elect. <sighs> My dear Lord, what well of tears may serve to feed the streams of my for dulled eyes, to weep thy death as doth such loss deserve, and wail thy lack in full sufficing wise? O mighty Jove, O heavens and heavenly powers, Wherein had he procured your disdain? He never sought with vast and huge towers to press aloft to vex your royal reign. For what offense have I commit unawares why thus against me your fury should be stirred to fraught me thus with woe and heavy cares? Nay, such for envy the heavens this conspired. The sun his bright virtues had in disdain. The mighty Mars at his manhood repine. Yea, all the gods, nay, could they so sustain each one to be excelled in his kind. Alas, my joy, where art thou now become? Thy sprite, I know, doth linger here about, and looks that I, poor wretch, should come after. I would, God what, my lord, if so I mought. But yet abide. I may perhaps devise some way to be unburdened of my life and with my ghost approach thee in some wise to do therein the duty of a wife. Act 1, Scene 3, Tancred cometh out of his palace. Dear daughter, stay the fury of your mind and stint your tears which may not aught avail. Such bootless plaint as hath no timely end doth but heap grief to give new cause to wail. The world doth know. There lacked not of your part aught that belonged unto a faithful wife, nor aught that might be had by help of art. Yet all you see could not prolong his life. His date that nature set was come. Let be these vain complaints. Small good to him you do. Much hurt unto yourself. Most grief to me. Great strong to nature to withstand her so. Oh, sir. Was this of nature's course the date, whereof as yet one half he had not passed? Nay, nay, God wot, it was my cruel fate that spied it at my pleasant life for past. Yea, nature's course, I say, as proof doth teach, that hath no stint but as the heavens guide. His lamp of life it could no farther reach, by foreset fate it might no longer bide. <sighs> Cursed be the fate that so foreset my loving daughter, set this grief apart. The more you are with hard mishap beset, the more your patience shows a constant heart. What hap? 
alas, may countervail my drear. Or else what hope thus comfortless alone may I conceive, now having lost my fear? What may I do but still his death bemoan? My mind, alas, it wanteth now the stay, whereon was wont to lean my reckless thought. My Lord is gone, my joy is reft away, that all with cares my heart is overfraught. In him was all my pleasure and delight. To him gave I the fruits of my first love. He with the comfort of his only sight, all cares out of my breast could soon remove. But now, alas, my joys for past to tell doth but renew the sorrows of my heart and maketh me with dolor to rebel against the fates that so have wrought my smart. My daughter, cease your sorrow and your plaint, not can your grief this helpless chance recure. What doth avail to make such hard complaint? A noble heart each hap can well endure. And though your husband death hath reft away, yet life a loving father doth sustain, who during life to you a double stay as father and as husband will remain with doubled love to ease your grief for want of him whose love is cause of your complaint. Forget therefore this vain and ruthful care, and let not tears your youthful beauty pair. Oh, sir, these tears love challengeth his due. But reason saith they do no wit avail. Yet can I not my passions so subdue? Your fond affections ought not to prevail. Who can but plain the loss of such a one? Of mortal things no loss should seem so strange. Such gem was he as erst was never none. Well, let that pass, and suffer so this change as that therein your wisdom may appear. Let reason work in you which time doth bring to meanest wits, which time doth teach to bear the greatest ills. So plenteous is the spring of sorrows that surmounten in such sort reason in me, and so increaseth my smart, that neither can your fatherly comfort nor counsel aught remove out of my heart the sweet remembrance of him that was here in earth mine only joy. But as I may, I will both serve his sprite that was my fear with plaint and tears, and ache your will obey. Well, Tancred and Gismond depart into the palace. Enter Chorus. The diverse haps which always work our care, our joy so far, our woe so near at hand, have long ere this and daily do declare the fickle foot on which our state doth stand. Who plants his pleasures here to gather root and hopes his happy life will still endure, let him behold how death with stealing footsteps in with when he shall think his joys most sure. No ransom serves for to redeem our days. If prowess could preserve our worthy deeds, he has yet lived, whose 12 labors displays his growing frame. And yet his honor speak, spreads uh, the great king that with no small power bereft the mighty Persian his crown is eke. Is witness eke, our life is but a flower, though it be decked with honor and renown, which grows today in favor of the heaven, nursed with the sun and with the showers sweet, plucked with the hand it withereth yet ere even. So pass our days even as the rivers fleet, so the, so the famous Greeks that under Troy gave the ten-year siege left but their name behind, and he that did so long and only saved his father's walls from there at last his end. High Rome herself, that Willem laid her yoke on the wide world and vanished all with war, vanquished all with war. Yet could she not remove the fatal stroke of death for the for thee that stretched her power so far? Look what the cruel, cruel sisters do decree. The mighty love him, the mighty Jove himself cannot remove. They are the servants of the heavens high to work beneath what is conspired above. But happy is he that ends this mortal life by speedy death, who is not forced to see the many cares, nor the sundry, nor feel the sundry grief. 
which we sustain in woe and misery. Here fortune rules, who, when she's list to play, whirleth her wheel and brings the high full low. Tomorrow takes what she hath given today to show she can advance and overthrow. Not Europus unquiet flood so soft ebbs in a day and floweth to and fro, as fortune's change plucks down that was aloft. And min and minds of mortal joy with mortal woe, mingles of mortal joy with mortal woe, whose case is such that fro his coat he may behold the, afar the change that chance, chanceth here. How soon they rise, how soon they do decay, leave their states on fortune's slipper the sphere. Who lives alone and feeleth not the strokes of storms with which the highest towers do fall? Nay, blustering winds with which the stoutest oaks stooping down full low. His life is surest of all. For he may scorn fortune that hath no power on him, but discontent with his estate. He seeketh not her sweet, he may fears her sour, but lives alone within his bounded rate, and marking how these worldly things do wade, rejoiceth to himself and laughs to see the folly of mortal men, how they have made fortune to God and placed her in the sky. And thus ends Act One, as written by Roderick Stafford. Um, that's fascinating. Um, the chorus at the end there uh, in the later version is split into four, but broadly speaking remains pretty much the same. Um, the shape of the scene with Gizmunda and Tancred and Gizmunda's speech, he, the overall shape of it's the same, but the words are all different. Um, it's, 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 it's a totally different. It's like... If the line ended with a thought, it now begins with the thought, and 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 everything sort of switched round in, in a really interesting way. Um, I, I'm not going to, you know, make a qualitative judgment between the two. I mean, I I, I think they both do an interesting job. I, I'm sort of now interested in thinking about ro what Robert Wilmot thought was old fashioned. What in his language did he say? Well, when I was a student, this was what we went for. And now today, I don't think the modern print market will go for that turn of phrase or that word choice. Because uh, there's lots of little just minor word choices where you go that maybe they just felt that's a bit old hat. And that's really interesting because, of course, we don't really feel that difference now in the same way. You know, it's all old. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> once 400 years or odd years have passed, I, you know, it's quite hard for us to hear the difference between um though those two things um i'm still enjoying it i think they're both they both function quite well um but i don't know what the room thinks um uh gizmonda how were you feeling the difference between the two um you know uh, and and do your cats have any any opinions on on, on that um um yeah i i ha i i don't know well we were while we were reading it i was like i've been here in this exact scene all the world words are different there's a different, um, there's a really different pace to this. Uh, yeah, um, than the other one. I don't know how to say it. Like, it, it sounds more co modernly conversational in a way. There's some, there's some way that they change the lines that I don't know how to uh, really describe it, but it just changes the pace completely and makes you breathe in different places. Um, uh, and has a completely different effect. Uh, I, I don't know if that speaks to something uh, about the uh, space that they were performing this in, because it seems like a much quieter uh, scene, whereas, uh, I don't know, it seems like in the other version, more of a blow up. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's little word choices as well. You know, Tancred says, you know, dear daughter um uh, and uh, and my daughter and things like that whereas you um uh some of which you have elsewhere but um you know it's rather than fair daughter in the later version uh you know and we don't obviously have the the, the later version suggests that there was singing now there might have been singing in the original that just isn't recorded in in the manuscript 
But, you know, was there a song there between... Uh, we don't have a, a chorus of handmaidens uh, apparent. You know, we've only got one chorus listed in this earlier version, um, which is telling the truth. Um, so, because that's quite a different thing if Gizmonda isn't surrounded by people who are singing sadly and then her father enters to it whereas in this version it's just Gizmonda and her father comes in and says don't be sad um and that's quite a different game uh Liza well it's plausible I mean the inns of court all have chapels the chapels all have choirs so they do have singers on hand mm. um and it would be uh, uh also some of the young law students may may be able to sing um singing and reading music was considered a gentlemanly art so uh it's really an interesting prospect yeah it, it, it says odd that the the manuscript for the show does not indicate that they were singing whereas a much later thing that that doesn't give us any data on the songs at all does that you you, you put that data in so i i'm i'm it's a really interesting question what what has authority here as to what that original performance had because it feels like that is data that that is confusing the issue slightly. Um, but it does change the nature of the scene totally uh, by having the chorus apparent as several figures who are explicitly her handmaids. Uh, whereas in this, the, scene, the dramatic scene, there is no indication that that is the case. There's no call out to the, the handmaidens. There's no call for anyone to sing. So, and the chorus is just one blob of text. Um, Rachel, you've been waving for ages. I'm sorry. No. Um. Uh. Oh my gosh. Uh. Also, the um, as uh, as soldiers, guards, or whatever that come in with Tancred are missing here too. So mm. there's a different um, energy to him. There's not the. It seems like they don't have the same. Uh. They're not the same. Uh, Gismund and Tancred from the other play he's not as he doesn't come off in the first scene as uh violent or um i don't know commanding necessary not that he's not commanding but like you know not with the same kingly energy um also i want i'm wondering about like uh if the ends of court is made of stone or something like that or the material of the physical place uh versus like a, a wooden theater or something like that if uh there's if we have this change of pace and these change of words and there's you know something less um that less polished that gets put on if if the ends of court is made of stone and somebody can correct me because i have no idea what the ends of court even is still that um that that maybe there's more you don't need to project as much because of a natural echo or something i don't know uh, well, regardless whether it's wood and stone or wood or stone, it's probably quite echoey. The the, the kind of spaces. Uh, I mean, it depends how many bodies are mashed into the space as well. I mean, it's quite difficult to recreate that with a modern audience because health and safety. You're not allowed to cram as many people in um, because bodies are basically sound absorption. Um, but broadly speaking, the 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 the, the kind of uh, spaces w would have had some kind of an echo, um, which is possibly why you end up with the the shape of shows as they are because um of the the kind of text you can actually uh safely project in there but uh, i don't know i genuinely don't know what the actual interiors would have been like probably wooden um but the actual building may have been made of stone uh uh with with interior cladding anyway uh greg I'm, I may be confusing scenes here. I felt, ten, I, I think this has been said already, actually, Tancred's journey in that scene seemed more linear, less, because I seem to remember when we did the second look, the B text, Tancred goes on a hell of a journey in a very short space of time. And he just doesn't, he seemed nicer this time. And I, I'm, I'm interested to know what happens out later. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I felt he was nicer. I thought he was nicer in this one. You know, he, you know, so it's that just that single word change of, you know, uh, the originally dear daughter, uh, you know, stay the fury of your mind. He comes in when she's talking about, uh, you know, uh, uh, do, doing, uh, uh, giving into despair. And, you know, he, there's an energy to that entrance and an energy to that. Um, I don't know if we've quite got to his 
vault face yet. I, uh, but I think it was there were more seeds in the original in the later version. Um, the uh, or, or a fast turnaround. Anyway, uh, Liza than Eric. Oh, uh, just just that. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. Tancred is he 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 seems set up as as more kindly and 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 fatherly this time and less of a of an irrational tyrant. Uh, and I quite like that setup because it lets us change gears later mm. on. The the only thing like. I noticed the author bringing in that sort of creepy, incestuous note on him promising to be father and husband to her, and it's like, uh, you? Uh, I yeah. mean, I, again, he could possibly just mean in kindness and support and that kind of love. He could possibly. We all know that. <laughs> we all know it's going to go downhill fast. Yeah, I mean that note's in the later version as well, so I think um, I think we can still go with the ness. I think it's a, a valid uh, a valid artistic uh, expression. Uh, Eric. Yeah, I was gonna say that like if he's nicer at the beginning, then there's more like a sort of a greater drop for him later on, <laughs> uh, like further to fall kind of thing. Mm. Um, also, that thing about the EU, yeah, I am very aware that we had the whole wrapping himself in her bed, in, in in her in her sheets or something, and I was like, no, <laughs> why would you do this? But yeah, um, I don't know. We haven't quite got there yet. It'd be interesting to see how that's portrayed or described uh, in this version. The uh, the prologue makes it sound. The argument makes it sound um, much less icky uh, than than the the text in the play did. So, because um, it's uh, it's more hiding behind the bed curtains, um, as described in the uh, the argument. But uh, the the text in the uh, in in the speeches uh, presents quite a different picture. But we'll see if this this version does that. We're going to go to Act Two, Scene One. Um, uh, Henry Noel uh, wrote this act. Uh, act two, scene one, uh, we have a Gizmond and Lucrece coming out of Gizmond's chamber. Dear aunt, when in my secret thought I weigh my present state and my forepast today, new heaps of cares afresh begin to assay my pensive heart, as when the glistering rays of bright Phoebus are suddenly overspread with foul black clouds that dim their golden light namely when i laid in my secret bed amid the silence of the quiet night with curious thought present before mine eyes of gladsome youth how fleeting is the course how soon the fading flower of beauty dies how time once how time once past may never have recourse no more than may the running streams revert to climb the hills when they been ones down rolled amid the hollow vales. There is no art, no worldly power. No, not the gods can hold the sway of fleeing time, nor him revoke when he is past. All things unto his might perforce must bend and yield unto the stroke of time. This makes me in the silent night off to record how fast my youth withdraws itself away. How swift doth run his race, my pleasant life. This, this aunt is the cause. When I advise me sadly on my case that maketh me in pensive dumps to stay. For if I should my pleasant years neglect of fresh green youth fruitless to fade away where to live i where to hath nature decked me with so seemly shape but neither i can so consent all soul my youth to pass or still i trust my father will deny to marry me again my present case of widow's state hath grieved me too much and pleased him too long for if he lists remarry me, is my hard fortune such, dear aunt, that I so long should thus persist, makeless, alone, and woeful widow's life? No, no, such hap should not so long for wast my youthful days, which brings me greater grief. 
when I sometime record my pleasure past. But what though? I force not. I will remain still at my father's hest and drive away these fancies quite. But yet my chiefest pain is that I stand at such uncertain stay. For if my lingering father would pronounce his final dome, that I must drive forth still my life as I do now. I would renounce mine own free choice and frame me to his will. In widow's state with patience would I pass my days and as I might would bear the grief and force myself contented with such case to live, alas, a soul forsaken life. But now his silence doubleth all my smart well, that my doubtful thoughts tween hope and fear and cruel wise disdain my careful heart. So toss my grieful mind that but your aid, I find no quiet port where to arrive. Suffice it this, good niece, that you have said. Full well I see how sundry passions strive in your unquiet breast. For oft ere this, your countenance half confused did plainly show some cloudy thoughts overwhel overwhelmed all your bliss. The ground whereof sins I perceive to grow on just respect of this your soul estate and skilful care of acting youth's decay, your wise foresight, such sorrowing all too late to shew. Much do I praise, and as I may, here do I promise you to break the same unto your father and to work it so, as both to keep your honour and your fame, to yield you your desire, and ease your woe. Be you no farther grieved, but do you go into your chamber. I shall, as I may, perform your will, and you shall shortly know what I have wrought, and what the king doth say. My niece shall not impute the cause to be, in my default, her will should want effect. But in the king is all my doubt, lest he my suit for her new marriage will reject. Yet will I prove, and lo, himself I see approach, in happy time I trust it be. Uh, Gismund departeth into a chamber, which I suggest actually happened about six lines earlier. Lucrece abiding on the stage to do those six lines, and then Tancred cometh out of his palace. Sir, as I have implied my slender plough... Pl look. Sir, as I have implied my slender powers by faithful service, such as lay in me, in my best wise to honour you and yours, nor never sought to hold in privity the thing that in my simple knowledge was, whereby I might in any part advance your royal state, which long in honour's race the gods might guide and shield for all mischance. So now my bounden duty moveth me to move to you concerning the estate, lo, of my niece your daughter, which as you see the worthy prince her husband now of late hath buried. But I see and perceive that she hath not laid up with him in grave those sparks of senses which she did receive when kind to her both life and body gave. Nor with her husband's death her life doth cease, but she yet lives, and living she doth feel. Such passions hold her tender heart in press, as show the same not to be wrought of steel, or earned out of the hard and stony rock, that, that as by course of kind can naught desire, nor feeleth naught but as a senseless stock. Such stern hardness nay ought ye to require in her, whose gentle heart and tender years, yet flowering in her chiefest lust of youth, is led of force to feel the hot desires that fall unto that age, and asketh ruth of your wanted father tender love, whom nature bindeth by your grave foresight to care for her of things that are above her feeble force and far surpass her might. And, sir, although... Sister, I you beseech, if you esteem or ought respect my life, do stint and wade no farther in this speech. 
Your words do slay my heart. As if the knife in cruel wise forthwith should pierce the same, for well I see whereto your tale doth tend. This feared I when you began to name my daughter once. Alas, and is the end of my poor life that broken is and done so long a time to stay. Why live I then? Why draw I forth my days under the sun? My latter hour approacheth lo, and when my dear daughter closed hath mine eyes, and with her woeful tears bewept my grave, then is her duty done, in perfect wise. There is no farther service I may crave. But while the fates sustain my fainting breath, her joyful presence will I not forgo. Rather will I consent unto my death than so to spend my days in pining woe. Her late marriage hath taught me to my grief that in the fruits of her desired sight doth rest the only comfort and relief of my unwieldy age. For what delight, what joy, what comfort in this earth have I if my Gizmonda should depart from me? O oh, daughter, daughter, rather let me die some sudden cruel death than live to see my house yet once again stand desolate by thine absence. O oh, let such fancies be. Tell her I am her father, whose estate, wealth, honor, life, and all that is in me doth wholly rest on her. Tell her I must accompt her all my joy and my relief. Work as she will, but yet she were unjust to seek to haste his death that gave her life. And Tancred and Lucrece depart into the palace. Gizmunda cometh out of her chamber. By this I hope mine aunt hath moved so unto the king in my behalf, that I, without delay, his settled mind shall know, and end at once all this perplexity. And Lucrece returneth from the palace. And lo, where now she comes, Lord, how my heart in doubtful thoughts doth pant within my breast, for in her speedy recure of all my smart, and quiet of my troubled mind doth rest. Niece, on this, on the point you lately willed me to treat of with the king in your behalf, lo, I, I break even now with him so far, till he, in sudden rage of grief, ere I scarce half my tale had told, prayed me to stint my suit, as that from which his mind abhorred most. And well I see, his fancy to refute is but displeasure gained and labour lost. So firmly fixed stands his fond delight that till his aged corpse be laid in grave, he will not part from the desired sight of your presence, which seldom he should have if he had once allied you again to, in marriage to any prince or peer. This is his final sentence, plat and plain. And therefore mine advice shall be to steer no further in this case. But since his will is grounded on his fatherly love to you, and that it lieth in you to save or spill his old for wasted age, you, you ought to shew to seek the thing that should so much aggrieve his tender heart. And in the state you stand, content yourself. And let this thought relieve all your unquiet thoughts, that in your hand your aged father's life doth rest and stay. Sins without you it may not long endure, but run to ruthful ruin and decay. Dear aunt, sith neither can my case procure, nor your request entreat, nor sage advise can aught persuade my father's fixed mind to grant me my desire and willing wise. I can no more, but bend myself to find means as I may to frame my yielding heart to serve his will. And as I may to drive the passions from my breast that breed my smart and diversely distract me, do strive to hold my mind subdued in daily pain, whom yet, I fear, I shall resist in vain. And Gizmund and Lucrece depart into Gizmund's chamber. Enter Chorus. 
Who marks our former times and present years, what we are now and looks what we have been? He cannot but lament with many tears the great decay and change of mortal men. For as the world wore on and waxed old, so virtue quailed and vice began to grow, so that that age that Willem was of gold is worse than brass more vile than iron now. These times were such that if we ought believe our stories old, women examples were of high virtues. Lucrece disdained to live longer than chaste, and boldly without fear took sharp revenge on her oppressed corpse with her own hand, for that it not withstood the wanton will but yielded to the force of proud Tarquin and brought her fame with blood. Queen Artemis thought not an heap of stones, though they the world's wonder were full wide, a worthy grave wherein to rest the bones of her dead lord for ever to abide, but drank his heart and made her tender breast his tomb and failed not of wively faith of promised love and of her bound behest until she ended had her days by death ulysses wife such was her steadfastness abode his slow return whole twenty years and spent her youthful days in pensiveness bathing her widow's bed with often tears the stout daughter of cato brutus wife when she had heard his death did not desire longer to live, and lacking use of knife, a strange death, ended her life by fire, and ate hot burning coals. A worthy dame, virtues worthy of eternal praise. The flood of Lethe cannot wash out thy fame to others great reproach, shame and dispraise. Rare are those virtues now in women's mind. Where shall ye seek a white so firm and true? Scarce can you now among a thousand find one steadfast heart. We all delight in new. The lady that so late lamented here her prince's death and thought to live alone, as doth the turtle true without her fear. Behold how soon that constant mind is gone. I think those good ladies that lived here, a mirror and a glass to womankind, and in their lives their virtues held so dear, had them to grave and left them not behind. Else in so many years we might have seen as good and virtuous dames as they have been. And thus ends Act 2. Uh, again, it's all the right notes, but all played in a slightly different order. Um, I mean, what's really interesting, in the original stage version, everything is very simple. There are no extraneous stuff. It's like Wilmot went, OK, in the imagination of, of the written page, we will have a hunt come on. Um, we will have dogs. We will have hunters. We will have all the ex uh, the pointless characters who say nothing, but uh, and then exit again. And here we just have the the these exchanges, which are very speechy. People turn on and make speeches at each other. Um, whereas in the later rewrite, there are more interjections. Um, it's it's actually weird. Uh, it's weird because in theory, uh, the later version is more dynamic. And yet, actually, I think these speeches are actually more dynamic than the later reworks. So you sort of gain something and you sort of lose something. It's, it's really in, it's really interesting um, how that works, because we have a very formal passage that isn't in this version at all, where Lucrece and Tancred are, are, are bouncing lines off each other. Um, and it's, it's not here at all. Um, and when uh, Tancred first comes in, he's, you know, he's talking to some lords who, you know, I think we commented when we first read it of just going, well, they enter for no readily apparent reason and then walk off again. Um, and um, yeah, there's a reason for that because they never entered in the original version. Uh, they were not there uh, because the stage is not does not seem to be able to accommodate too many people on stage at the same time. It seems very pragmatic that this original version. I also don't think 
in the original uh it's it's down as one chorus and it feels like it's one chorus the chorus breaks in the later version into four speakers that there's no order to the way the stanzas are sort of broken up they're, they're all different lengths um and um it's not a great chorus either i don't like that chorus at all i i often don't like the choruses but that the chorus really could happily get in the sea um so yeah thoughts from the room i know i'm i'm whittling on whittering on uh angela i just love how this is all turning out to be grismunda's fault mm. and by love obviously i mean the opposite mm. Mm. yeah there's some 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 bad things going on here uh rachel then eric yeah um a, a couple things i guess um that, uh, you know, the play we're doing in the afternoon, uh, the Dr Drury, the widow from that, you know, that uh, Gismond is actually a widow too. Uh, and the difference uh, in the way that she's being treated here, you know, um, versus uh, other widows, that she's still very much being treated like she was never married at all. Um, uh, and then also, uh, Kind of what Angela said before about the argument that, uh, you know, why would you have the whole thing there? And I thought uh, maybe not if it, maybe if you're not there for the plot, or if it's something like uh, I, I don't know, maybe Liza could say more about it, like in opera, that it's not necessarily for the plot, but it's there for like the you're there for the music, and maybe this is like a sort of um poetry reading almost because this it, like the even though in the other one there's those long speeches there is a different um dynamic to it and this does the way this one is written kind of feels like um who was that guy that we read that did a uh, king darius and then the other one that little that little weirdo play that was actually uh, really nice yeah, but it, it, the weird thing is, I, I I think the dialogue in this original one is less poetic. Um, it's much more direct than the later rewrite, which feels much more literary and much more thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, 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 I do think there is that element for a lot of these plays where the, the drama isn't the thing. I mean, it, it may be, I say, it's, it may be just simply that because of the nature of the space, because it's a it's not as performable um you can't have lots of action because nobody can move there isn't enough room um it's a bit echoey you have to stand still and do your speech really clearly um and therefore you can't do the same kind of thing you do in a public playhouse uh but that that is a that is a conjecture uh, eric then liza uh yeah i was just gonna say that chorus speech going yes all women who are you know widowed should kill themselves it's kind of like eh, i don't know how this is going to play today yeah who is this chorus and why are they in my head why are they here please go away um uh liza well it's i wonder i wonder if the chorus is meant to be commenting from from something of something like a modern christian uh, well modern for the time, contemporary of the performance christian point of view um, the the other thing, Rob, I agree that the speeches here are more dynamic. They do read a little bit more like something that's been written to be performed rather than something that's been written for literary merit. And I do miss that Lucrece in the in the version that we read, the printed version, that Lucrece puts up a fight and there's mm. some antiphony. And I don't know if if space constraints or, or echoiness can justify that not being there because we've seen other inns of court plays. We've seen Yocasta, for example, where you do get long speeches, but you also get mm. Antiphony, some really nice passages of Antiphony. But although although Yocasta may have been intended for outdoor performance, we don't know. Um, mm. But, but uh, there are others. You're, no, you're right. I'm, 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 I'm just saying words. You, you can ignore It's OK. That's all any of us are doing. Um, but yeah, um, but it, it says it's that 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 formalness. It, it, but it is a shame. I would like a few more interjections, 
but this style of verse, if that makes sense. I'd, 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 I'd like it to be just that long. I mean, we can always mix and match. I mean, I am now doing that, but it's going to be one hell of a job to try and figure out what you want to do um, and how you want to dance around them. Uh, any other thoughts on Act 2 before we dive into Act 3? Rachel? I don't know. Like, even though it's not as is as polished in the other way there's still that that sort of like I, I don't know about the maybe the reason I'm, I'm feeling like it's poetry is because the tension that we have in the other version you know Tancred walking in with the soldiers or um Liza just said something that that with uh Lucrece you know going back against him the those are all like points of of uh tension that create drama and create the, that dynamic, di, dy, dynamic uh, that we don't have here, where this just seems to flow and then kind of seamlessly into the next thing, the next person does their, their, uh, their recitation. And maybe we don't have that, uh, maybe we don't have that back and forth because they're afraid that it'll uh, do something muddle the sound muddy the sound in whatever performance space they're in or you know whatever constraints they have mm. um and it, it is a real shame because lucrece in the uh the rewrite gets this uh, little coda after the tancred walks out whereas in this he just walks out they just walk off together in theory um where she actually stays on stage and gives Mondo meets her and just and she just goes he cannot hear anger hath stopped his ears and over love his judgment have decayed ah my poor niece i shrewdly fear thy cause thy just complaint shall never be relieved uh i don't know if that gets recycled somewhere or comes from somewhere else but it's a it's a really nice tag that we don't have in this ver this earlier version um and it's um yeah it feels it feels necessary um but anyway I'm being perhaps unfair on the early version. The early version didn't know that version was there, going to be there at the time. 2020 hindsight is a wonderful thing. Uh, let us go into Act 3, and it's the return of... Uh, this act is by G. Al. Uh, we don't know their name. We just have some initials and some letters. Um, so, um, unless it's... Yeah, so Act 3, Scene 1, the return of Cupid. Cupid returneth out of the palace. Now shall they know what mighty love can do that proudly practiced to deface his name and vainly striven with so strong a foe. From sparks increased by blast biasing flame shall show how love can kindle hearts with heat and waste the oaken breast to cinder dust. Gizmond have I now framed to forget her turtle's truth and burn with raging lust. I made her doting father her deny in the wheelful, wively state to taste again, and Juno thus foreclosed. I made to fly a thrilling shaft that pierced her through youthful veins with love of Count Palarine, and he doth feel like wound sent from my deadly bow. The means to meet her have I taught, and she by cloven cane shall do the ear of to know. So shall they joy in tasting of the sweet to make them judge more grief, more feelingly the grief that bitter brings. And when their joy shall fleet and your redoubled dole without relief, their death shall make the earth to know my might and how far it, how it is far better to obey my gentle hastes than with rebelling spite my reeking wrath and power to essay. Their ghosts shall do the grisly hells to hear what God is love. To heaven will I remount to love and all gods that dwell there. In the throne of triumph, now will I recount how I, by sharp revenge on earthly wise, will be renowned to earth and helly sprites. And has for cease uns unserved to sit in vain, a god men unpunished made this stain. And Cupid remounteth to heaven. Uh, act 3, scene 2. Claudia cometh out of Gizmond's chamber. Pity that moveth every gentle heart to rue their grief will be distressed in pain. Enforceth me to wail, my lady's smart. The restless toil that her unquiet mind doth cause her feeble body to endure. 
why it is, alas, I cannot find, nor know no re sorry, nor no no mean her rest how to procure this remedy as I of duty sought in all that to a servant doth belong with careful heart I have procured and sought the small effect be of my travail sprung and oft times as I durst I have essayed with humble words my lady to require to tell it me but she have so denied that it abashed me further to inquire or ask from whence those cloudy thoughts proceed whose stormy force that smoky sighs forth send is lively witness how that careful dread and hot desire within her breast can end whose sharp conflict disquiets her so sore that heavy sleep cannot procure her rest but fearful dreams present her ever more most hideous sights her mind for to molest but startling off therewith she doth awake to muse upon those fancies which torment her thoughtful heart with horror that doth make the sweat or cold brast forth incontinent from her weak limes while the quiet night gives other rest she turning to and fro doth wish for day but when day bringeth light, she keepeth her bed, there to record her woe. And when she doth arise, her flowing tears stream forth fast, fully maint with deadly groans, whereby her inward sorrow so appears. I've lost my place. Um, so appears that, oh, tear... O oh, tears eke the cause unknown bemoans, and if she be constrained to abide in peace, her, tum her trembling voice she scarcely may restrain from careful plaints, which restraint doth increase their force, when place gives liberty to blame. To others talk when, as she should intend, her heaped cares, her wits done so impressed, oppress that what they speak or where to their words tend, she knoweth not after answers to express her chief delight is i to be alone her pensive thoughts within themselves debate but whereupon this restless life is grown since i know not nor how the same to bait i can no more but love thou knowest it best i'll shortly bring my lady's heart to rest and claudia departeth to gisman's chamber act three scene three Gishard cometh out of the palace. How grievous pain they dure, which neither may forget their love nor yet enjoy the same. I know by proof, and daily make a say. Though love hath brought my lady's heart in frame, my faithful love with like love to repay, that doth not quench, but rather cause to flame the creeping fire which spreadeth in my breast, whose raging heat grants me no time of rest. If they bewail their cruel destiny, which spend their love where they no love do find, well may I plain, since fortune guideth me to this torment of far more grievous kind, wherein I feel as much extremity as may be felt in body or in mind, by seeing her which should recure my pain, for my distress like sorrow to sustain. I well perceive that only I alone am her beloved, her countenance telleth me so. Wherefore, of right, I have good cause to moan her heavy plight that pitieth so my woe. Sith either's love is thus in other grown, I her to serve, she me without and mo other only to love. O oh, love, help that we may enjoy our love, of thee I humbly pray. For I see plain that she desireth no less, that we should meet for to assuage our grief, then I, if she could bring the same to pass, that none it wist, as it appeareth by proof of her gestures, which showen me, alas, how she assents that I should have relief of my distress, if she could work the same, keeping herself from danger of defame. And even now, this cane I did receive of her own hand. What, what gift, though it be small, Receiving it, what joy I did conceive within my fainting spirit therewithal, who knoweth love aright may well perceive by like adventures that to them befall. 
from needs the lover must esteem that well which cometh from her with whom his heart doth dwell. Assuredly, it is not without cause she gave me this, something she meant thereby. For therewithal I might perceive her pause a while, as though some weighty thing did lie upon her heart, which she concealed because the bystanders should not our love espy. This cliff declares that it hath been disclosed. Perhaps herein she hath something enclosed. He breaks the cane and finds a letter enclosed. Oh, mighty Jove, who would not joy to serve a letter where wit and beauty chosen have their place? Who, ah yes, O oh, mighty Jove, who would not joy to serve where wit and beauty chosen have their place? Who could devise more wisely to conserve things from suspect? O oh, Venus, for thy grace that thus hath worthied me for to deserve so precious love, how lucky is this case. This letter sure some joyful news contains. I trust it brings recure of both our pains. And he readeth. Mine own, as I am yours whose heart I know, no less than mine for lingering help of woe doth long too long. Love, tendering your case and mine, hath taught recure of both our pain. My chamber floor doth hide a cave where was a vault's one mouth, the other in the plain doth rise southward a furlong from the wall. Descend you there, this shall suffice. And so. I yield myself, mine honour, life, and all, to you. Use you the same as there may grow your bliss and mine, mine earl, and that the same free may abide, abide from danger of defame. Farewell and fare so well as that your joy, which only can, may comfort my annoy. Yours more than her own, G. <gasps> O oh, love, O oh, joyful hour, O oh, heavenly hap, O oh, blissful chance, recure of all my woe, comes this from Gismund. Did she thus enwrap this letter in the cane? May it be so. Huh, it cannot be, it were too sweet a joy. Why shall I doubt? Did she not give the same to me? Did she not smile and seem to joy therewith? She smiled, she joyed, she wrought the cane, and with her own sweet hand she gave it me. O oh, noble queen, my joy, my heart's dear, sweet letter, how may I welcome thee? I kiss thee. On my knees I honor here both hand and pen wherewith thou written were. Oh, blessed be that cave and he that taught thee to descry the hidden entry there not only through a dark and ugly vault, but fire and sword, or through whatever be, mine own dear lady, will I come to thee. And Guisard departeth into the palace. Enter Chorus. Almighty is thy power, O cruel love, if love himself cannot resist thy bow, but sendest him down, even from the heavens above, in sundry shapes here to the earth below. Then how should mortal men escape thy darts, the fervent flame and burning of thy fire? Both of the seas and land, the Lord and... Uh, wait, sorry, I skipped the line. Um, <laughs> then how should mortal men escape thy dart, the fervent flame and burning of thy fire? Since that thy might is such, and since thou art both of the sea and land, Lord and sire. But why doth she that sprang from love's head and Phoebus' sister Sheen, despise thy power, nay, fears thy bow. Why have they always led a maiden life and kept untouched their flower? Why doth Aegisthus love and to obtain his wicked will conspire his uncle's death? Or why doth Phaedra burn from whom is slain Theseus' chaste son? Or Helen false of faith? For love assaults not but the idle heart and such as live in pleasure and delight, he turneth oft their glad joys into smart, their play to plaint, their sport into despite. For lo, Diane, that chaseth with her bow the flying heart, the goat and foamy boar, 
by hill, by dale, in heat, in frost, in snow. No, nay, resteth not, but wandereth evermore. Love seeketh not, nor knows not where to find. While Paris kept his herd on Ida down, Cupid nay sought him not, for he is blind. Yet when he left the field to live in town, he fell into his snare and brought that brand from Greece to Troy, which after set on fire strong Ilium and all the frigid land. Such are the fruits of love, such is his hire, who yieldeth unto him his captive heart, ere he resists and holds his open breast without an war to take his bloody dart. Let him not think to shake it off when it him list is his heavy yoke. Resist his fault. First assault, weak is his bow, his quenched brand is cold. Cupid is but a child and cannot daunt the mind that bears him on his virtues bold. But he gives poison so to drunk, drink in gold and hides under such pleasant bait his hook. But ye beware, it be hard to hold your greedy mind. But if you wisely look what sly snake lurks under those flowers gay, but ye mistrust some cloudy storm and fear a white shower off your so fair a day, ye may repent and buy your pleasure dear. For seldom time does Cupid want to send unto a joyful love a joyful end. And exit cheerful chorus being cheerful as ever. Um, so yes, uh, significant differences, of course, that uh, Claudia uh, in this original uh, is basically that speech is retooled and just handed to Lucrece in the later version, which is sort of weird because I would have thought it would be, if you're going to do it, you'd do it the other way around, because uh, I'm sitting here going, well, that's how I'd do that. I'd avoid having an extra actor, but maybe they just had an actor who they thought, we'll give you a speech. It's not a big part. It's only in Act 3. You don't need to learn any other lines. Um, so maybe that's that's why this, this, this speech is doing that there. I mean, it's it's there to basically say that what Cupid is doing has started having an effect. And that's one of the things that we haven't really talked about is, you know, how much agency does any of the, do any of these characters have? Are they doing anything because of their own human actions or are they doing it because evil Cupid, vampire Cupid has swooped down and is ruined, destroying their lives? Um, and, you know, is it Tancred's fault uh, the things he's going to do, or is it the Furies? Is it? Is it? Is and is anything that Gisman doing it, uh, her fault or her her uh, uh, life, or is it just down to Cupid? So that's one of those questions that the play sort of brings up, uh, and it's all still there. I mean, otherwise it's it's the same mixture of very similar but also very different. Um, uh, the letter I think was almost exactly the same. I I don't think there were that many changes to the letter at all. Whereas the rest was very, you know, up and down and back to front. Uh, Angela. I mean, <clears throat> I see what you're saying about Cupid. You know, is it is Cupid in control or are the gods in control? But as Liza was saying earlier, this is nevertheless set in a kind of Christian context. So all these characters are supposed to combat these sorts of powers through their virtue so they're all being they're all being dismissed and as people who have flawed you know they've got flaws they're not sufficiently virtuous and it just uh, i don't know all seems a bit well it seems a bit harsh frankly <laughs> well, it's, it's 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 the way that you know these these classical gods are being retooled as demonic i mean cupid is is a sort of demonic imp here i mean there's nothing you know there's no cute to this character he's you know he is he, he drinks the the blood of his victims as uh, as he stated at the, at the opening we may overstate this point by the way uh, that, that whole vampire cupid thing but it's become a thing that we always talk about when we do this play uh rachel yeah i i was just gonna say about um uh Guis card coming right after cupid you know he's praying to love uh uh, in that godlike way, and Cupid's just left. It says he's just remounted uh, back to heaven. Um, and I wonder, like, also about the staging of that. And has Cupid been lurking in the background for a while, and now he's just left? And to that, uh, you know, that this one is Christian or something for um, 
I wonder if that's supposed to say something about idols and that this is part of the tragedy is that they're not um, praying to the God, but to all these other people. And that's why they're going without um, anybody hearing them. Because there's got to be a certain absence with the exit of Cupid that makes some part of this, uh, you know, call to love ironic. Yeah, well, I, I mean, it's just on the point about, you know, the, being in a Christian universe. Is the play itself really in a Christian universe? Is anyone ever calling on on, on a god or anything? Everyone's ca talking about classic Gaul mythology a lot, uh, you know, outside of the... Uh, uh, the way the, uh, the 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 world watching the play might view these things uh, within the logic of the play is this a Christian universe? Uh, I, I I don't know. I may have missed some Christiany bits, um, but um, I I don't know whether the play world is doing that. Very uh, true. Um, Eric. Well, uh, in the beginning, the first sonnet or something went, yeah, there's no heaven, heaven is on earth, so long as you enjoy your pleasures and take your whatever, enjoy enjoy your life and stuff. So I think that was kind of, although obviously they might not have read it out before the performance, I don't know how that would work with the sonnets. Um, it kind of implies that this is not set in, in that kind of world it's like, like sort of imagine a far a place far far away in a galaxy <laughs> far far away it's basically the scrolling text at the beginning of star wars um where everybody's you know, kind of, damned uh... yeah <laughs> but also kind of you know you have no choice but to fall in love it kind of it's like double-edged sword if you fall in love you die if you have fun you die yeah Oh, absolutely. Um, and yeah, it's that thing. Cupid's gone into the house and he's basically just been spraying everywhere like, uh, you know, some sort of cat. Uh, it's just going, love here and love here and you'll have no choice. And uh, yeah, yeah, you, you, it's, um, uh, it's, 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 um, and now he's left, having left love everywhere. Um, and uh, it's all going, going wrong. It's all, all misfiring. Um... Any other thoughts before we do a, a, a little bit more text? We only have a little bit more text, um, uh, as it were. Um, uh, uh, Angela, you have a question from the chat. Say it out loud and let's see what the room thinks. Well, it's just, it, it's interesting to me that Tancred doesn't seem to come in for any censure, you know, and he's, it's his unreasonable requirements, you know. The, was, uh, I don't know, just interesting that that's he i guess he's the patriarch he gets to choose but uh just seems odd. yes quite the in early modern terms angela you're the historian here but would i be correct in thinking that in early modern terms the duty of a good father would be to find a husband for his daughter uh because uh her weak and feeble female reasoning probably couldn't find as good a husband as her father could uh, and and to set her up in a household and see her established uh, before he died. Well, certainly at this level of society, you know, you you can expect an arranged marriage if you're in, you know, you're at this level of society. Um, and you could argue that, given that she's been married, you know, there were there were always some concerns around, you know, widows marrying. There were lots of jokes about it you know and things like this um so i suppose that you know maybe there's some issue i don't know what the classical uh, arguments were about that apart well we just had a whole string of examples of women who would never have dreamt of going with anybody else you know that was it i guess but um y yes but i think those those were examples of well me i i don't have the speech under my eye right now but it seemed like many of those were examples of women who mourned their, their first husbands. And I think Tancred's asking for a slightly different thing. He's asking that Gizmund be faithful to him, that her duty, he demands, he demands the obedience, which is, the, in early modern terms, the due of a father from a daughter, but he doesn't do his duty by her. And obedience and duty are both, are, are bound. Yes, because he's not, and he's not saying you must marry the person I choose. He's saying don't marry, 
Um, and he's being really... Well, uh, he hasn't been really weird about it yet. Um, he's been a bit weird. Um, he's going to get a lot weirder. Um, and this this question about whether Tancred's getting away with it scot-free, well, so far, all he's been is, is a bit evasive and a bit unreasonable. Um, he, it's going to get worse. Uh, and, and, and there's more of that. And it is that question, because I think... You know that that question from modern performance about what do you do with the chorus? Because I'm not a fan of the chorus in this play very much. We found ways to work with the chorus last time because we made them uh, really judgy and made them a sort of extension of character. Um, but also the, char the the chorus was various different people uh, last time as well, and there were there were all sorts of questions about what we do with that. Um, I don't know if we found a route through. Uh, especially as we've already sort of got a chorus with Cupid and with Megara um, as well. So it's almost like you don't need those additional voices. So I'm not sure, actually, I'm that that keen on the choruses. They might quietly disappear. But I could be wrong. We, maybe we'll find a useful one. But they're not landing well today, and I don't think they landed well last time. Uh, anyway, we have one more little bit of text to read because we're going to open Act 4 now. We're going to open the, the our Christmas presents early um, because uh, we've got one more speech I, uh, we're going to squeeze in, even though it's, it's not the most tidiest way of doing it. But uh, uh, let's let's end on a on a nice cheerful note uh, because we've already had we've had Cupid in the attic. Let's find out what's underneath the floorboards in this palace. Act 4, Scene 1, Megara ariseth. Out of hell. Vengeance and blood out of the deepest hells of hell. I bring the cursed house where Guzman dwells. Sent from the grisly god that holds his reign in Tartar's ugly realm, where Pelops sire Tantalus. And with his own son's flesh, whom he had slain, did feast the gods. With famine have his hire to gape and catch at flying fruits in vain and yielding waters with his gasping throat. Where stormy Aeolus' son with endless pain rolls up the rock. Where Titius hath his lot low to feed the gripe that gnaws his growing heart. Where proud Ixion, whirled on the wheel, pursues himself. Where Jew preserved smart the doleful damned ghosts in flames do feel. Thence do I mount. Thither the winged god is nephew to Atlas, that upholds the sky, have laid down through the earth with golden rod. The Stygian ferry Salern got souls did guide, and made report how... Love, that blinded boy, highly disdaining his renowned decay, slipped down from heaven, have filled with fickle joy Gizmunda's heart, and made her throw away chasteness of life to her immortal shame. <laughs> Binding to show by proof of woeful ends and terror unto those that did scorn his name. Black Pluto, that had found Cupid his friend Proserpina in winning Ceres' daughter, Queen of Hells, and partly moved by the grieved ghost of her late prince, that now in Tartar dwells, and prayed due pain for her that thus hath lost due much care of him by great and great advice of oh, Minos, Ea, and of Radaman and made me pierce the settled soil and rise above the earth with dole and drear to daunt the present joys wherewith Gizmunda now feeds her disdained heart. And so, to make Cupid lord of his will, <laughs> lo, I will throw into her father's breast this stinging snake, and into hers another will I cast. So strong with wrath, with ridiculous woe, ache shall be others' murder at the last. <laughs> Furious must aid when men will cease to know their gods, 
and hell shall send revenging pain to those whom shame from sin cannot restrain. And Megara entereth into the palace. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that was the opening of Act 4 by Robert Hatton, and it's almost word for word unchanged in the later version. I wonder why. Um, it's rather fab. Um, in the later version, we also have stage directions about throw, literally throwing Kate, uh, snakes in dumb show uh, so that they sort of uh, attack, attach, whereas here we just have just says uh, they're going to have snakes attached. So again, we get to this question of agency. They are now going to be having these stinging snakes um, doing things to them, um, and, and 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 just turning turning the the threat level up to eleven. That's what's going on here. That's 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 what's going. They're, they're just going to turn this up to eleven. So um, bad 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 stuff's coming. Bad stuff's coming. Um. Greg, did you enjoy that? No, hates it every minute. We need to correct some of the Greek names, and I'm sorry because I actually did the first pass at this, and obviously didn't find didn't work out some of those. Um, yes, yeah, some of those are either they're not wrong, but they're just not recognisable. Uh, um, are... Atas or whatever is what was the one I really thought. What that? Uh, it's not far off. It's just. Um, where is it? Uh, one of them, I thought that's not wrong. It just needs correcting a little. Um, anyway, I, I, I think it's all uh, textually accurate. Um, textually I think accurate. I, 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 I think I went back and uh, apart from uh, the uh, the A and the E being a, a single letter. Um, yes. Uh, yes. So that's the only oh. the only element that was I mean, not I, in the original. Aak. That was the one yeah. in Midas Aak and Avradamant. Yes. I'm not entirely yeah, certain. Yeah, yes. yeah. Ah. Eikas, but but short one syllable because of scansion. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, uh, the the name Proserpina is a gloss, I think. The line should just be in winning series, daughter, queen of hell. Mm, yes, yeah, so a couple uh, of those we've had uh, in. Um, uh, we've had one or two of those in other places. Uh, uh, yeah, the, the 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 text certainly. The, I think the, I've seen ones where it kind of has the name of the person who they're talking about. In the line, in the in the margin. So, but love it. I I I still. I, I mean, uh, Liza did such a brilliant job in the uh, second read of the first, the other version. Um, but it's a great. I, I love the fact that, as we've said before, and I can't remember if we've said this session, you know, you've got Cupid in the attic and the Furies in the in the basement. Mm. God help the house. That's all I can say. And I'm so looking forward to Tancred next session because I get the feeling some of the stuff we know is there comes is still there by the time we, we well, just, go back. just looking at the page for next time physically uh it looks the shape's different i mean literally i think the lines are are longer or the words are longer or this this it does not look the same on the page um uh, so i i'm suspecting that there's some uh, some interesting uh shape change that's occurred to some of this um and uh yeah uh, other structural stuff seems about the same but uh, yeah all sorts of changes may occur um but it gives us all sorts of options as we sort of career into final thoughts uh about staging because now we have these two different texts and and that gives us options as to you know picking and choosing bits we like um or just going for one and uh, you know accepting the bits we like and and uh embracing the bits we like and 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 scootling over the bits we don't like um um yeah it gives us all sorts of options because there's there's a lot i really like about this early version um it does seem clearer. Some of the later stuff just feels like it's just going, I'm now going to say the most obscure version of what I'm talking about in a slightly obtuse way, rather than just saying, these are people who do things, uh, as an example. Ta-da. Um, so there's something more immediate. Though occasionally it's, it, there, there are bits where you go, oh, that's actually really useful. That's quite helpful. That line would be nice. So, yeah. Um... Or we could just do it three different ways, um, you know, because, um, you know, we do do things more than once, so that's fine. 
I'm quite happy for variations uh, on a theme. Um, so, uh, final thoughts from the room. Uh, story so far, how we how we uh, liking this version? Um, what do we want to do with it? Uh, where do we want to go with it? Greg, any final thoughts? Um, I really like it. I I think there's something certainly in the first half, and I'll be curious to see how it pans out part two. Um, in trying to marry the two a little bit. Um, there are things that part of the second version definitely do bet, does better, maybe. But, um, yeah, really interesting play. And, um, yeah, I, I, I'm a fan of this anyway. I think it's a fab piece. And, I, and there are times, I, there are differences, but actually it works together quite well as a whole, even by the five different, four or five different people. So to me, so, yeah, no. Roll on Thursday, and I'm glad I came in tonight. <laughs> uh, Eric, any final thoughts from you, Vampire Cupid? Um... I think people need to obey more. They they just you know they 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 step out of line. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. It's it's an interesting piece because like there's a probably going. These are set paths and they're taking over more psychopaths and this is getting just worse and worse i mean obviously we know this because of the first well because of the version that we did first um i don't know how you would stage this or how you would even <laughs> where where to begin with this on on a stage um yeah oh, I, i've got I, I, two or three production ideas in my mind I, this this one just this, yeah there, the, there's too many ideas that's the problem it's um like there's a problem going you should just get like a vincent price version of it out there just because you know um or i don't know like alice cooper type things just because it's so over the top um <laughs> but then it like the the sort of what do you call it um the the themes are really really dark like i mean okay Alice Cooper, for example, has very dark themes, or you know, that kind of music has very dark themes, but it's just you can't take that seriously, or else it can sort of destroy you. Whereas this, it's like, okay, um, misogyny, there is suicide, <laughs> there is murder. Uh, it's like sort of, you know, going down the checklist of trigger warnings. Well, so this half of the play is. In, in in many ways, you know, we're 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 leaping it ahead to the stuff that actually happens next time, because we read the argument today. Um, but you know, in th that sense, that it's still quite tame so far. Uh, you know, Cupid talks a good game, and uh, and there are hints that Tancred's going off the rails. But for an early modern man, he's not actually completely beyond the pale, and. Um, uh, and Gizman's not in a great place, but then she is in a good place because she's, you know, oh, there's love. And there's this lovely love love story. Grishart has this lovely love thing in the middle of the play that's really quite nice and it's quite sweet. Um, but, of course, we know it's all going to go horribly, horribly wrong because immediately after that, Megara turns up <laughs> just going, oh, are you happy? Oh, let's not have that. Um, and, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to turn dark, but actually this, this half is not so dark. Um, in that way, there's certainly a lot of motion flying around, but um, it it it's it, it we don't quite have the Tancred going completely bonkers yet. Um, he that he was a bit more intemperate in the later version of by this stage. Um, whereas here he's not quite fallen off that 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 ladder yet. Uh, Angela, any final thoughts? Well, I, I was part of the first read, the first part of this, a long time ago. Mm. My recollection of it was that it was really quite full of emotion and risk. And also, you had no idea what would happen next. So we probably finished it in a similar place. But it didn't have all that kind of like, this is what's going to happen. You know, these are the terrible things that's going to happen. So I don't know whether knowing that ahead of time has kind of like, pulled pulled the tooth of risk if you sort of mean because you, you sort of know what's what's going to happen i don't know um but certainly this was a very clear read i think that's uh, that's certainly true but my my you know vague memory of this when we first did it was that it, it had an awful lot more kind of like power and, and tension in it mm. 
Um, so yeah, maybe we've lost some of the uh, the the gothic energy and uh, with with clarity. Um, yeah, maybe there is that. Rachel, any final thoughts? Yeah, um, I don't know that this this one where with Cupid leaving and then Megara coming on the it feels less of that possession that we had in the other texts to me and kind of like in Duchess of Malfi where there's, there's that section when the son is born and they talk about his um, you know the time of his birth and it's meant to have a certain like implication that sh you know even though it's been a happy until that point you know that it's going to take some turn like when you have Megara come on um it's very not very different from the other one I mean the way they're writing and the words they're using are very different but um I think they're both they're just very different but they're both very good like just in different ways there it's like they're almost different uh genres a little bit even even though they're written in that long speech style. Mm. And uh, Liza, any final thoughts? Um... Well, I, I get what you say about the Gothic energy feeling in some ways lessened, but on the other hand, this version seems to have much more of an arc to it that despite the best efforts uh, of Vampire Cupid, we, we get the feeling that before Megaira's speech, it might have all turned out all right somehow, like the power of love might have prevailed. Um, and uh, and in, so, so I think the point at which Megaira throws the stinging snakes into both Gizmonda's uh, breast and Tancred's is the point of no return for those characters. And I like the thought that it makes it more tragic if it might have been okay somehow. Um, also, like Megaira's speech, I was focusing on a bit towards the end where it says, um, and partly moved by the grieved ghost of her late prince that now in Tartar dwells, and prayed due pain for her that thus hath lost due care of him. So again, we have the, the motif of um women women who uh women who fall in love with someone else after their spouse is dead are evil and let's see i don't know whether marriage vows at the time said till death do us part i don't know whether that's like maybe a little later like 19th century uh i i would have to look up the the form of of service for that but um First of all, not only is this guy dead and therefore doesn't have a right to her, but he's in Tartarus. Like, dude went to hell. Why should he get to determine her fate? Uh, so, Gizmonda really is... Possession of her is claimed by two different men. One who has some right to her, some right to her duty, but has a duty back to her that he's not fulfilling. The other of whom is dead anyway. Uh, so that is, um, for me, that's a concern. I, I'd love to, to, you know, in, in the realm of fan fiction, I'm, I'm parachuting in and slapping both those guys around the head, even the one that's dead, even the one that I have to go to Tartarus to do it. Mm. Yeah, it's, 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 yeah, that. Um, I th I think the other element that uh, we we don't have here uh, is in the later version we've got uh, all these dumb shows or the indications of dumb shows, uh, which just sort of sets our imaginations on fire, even if we're not performing them, even if we're not even you know reading them out loud. Uh, you know, we've got all this visual stuff and music and. Um, uh, which, again, the way it's written in the later printed version does sound like it's describing something that was done. So before this act, there was heard a consort of sweet music which playing Tancred comes forth and draweth Gizmunda's curtains and lies down upon her bed. And then from under the stage ascendeth Grizzcard and he helpeth up Gizmunda. They amorously embrace and depart. 
the king ariseth in rage. Uh, then was heard and seen a storm of thunder and lightning in which the furies rise up. I mean, it's this thing, he's writing 25, 20 plus years later. Um, uh, is that an accurate recollection of something that's not in the manuscript um, of, of stuff they threw into the show? Um, uh, so that, in a sense, a truer interp version of this script, of the original performance script, needs to incorporate stuff in the printed script anyway. Um it's the kind of thing I'm saying just for any purists out there who complain if we start mixing and matching text. You know, tough. Um, you know, for all we know, it's just a... It, it was original. Just throwing that out there. Anyway, any uh, other final thoughts? We've gone around the room. I've witted on rather a lot tonight. I apologise. Um, all that remains then uh, is to thank all these wonderful readers for their wonderful reading. Thank you very much, everyone, and goodbye. I drink the lover's blood. Uh, hmm. Ah, ah, ah.